But as I said, I want to use our time for something more interesting in the class today. So I understand that the topics that we are covering in this course has a lot of equations and it looks very abstract. It looks very theoretical. It's hard for us to find out what is the real world application of that. Today, we are lucky of having one of former students and one of the former TAs of this course who is going to share with us his vision on the application of mechanics of materials in the real world. So John, let's welcome John here. So John was student of this course, and I think he took it in the same class, like this same classroom. Same classroom. Um, he was a TA after taking the course. He was a TA for the lab, also for the lecture. Also, he received his master. He was the very first student who worked on 3D printing of cement-based material at SNT and graduated with honor. Very good students, a lot of achievements, a Greenberg scholar, uh, president of Steelbridge Design Team, Ka Epsilon. Uh, it's it's going to be a long list to mention all of them, but he was a very good student and he's been with uh, Burns and McDonnell since 2019 at in Kansas City. And he's going to share his vision about the application of mechanics and materials in the real world. Okay, how's everybody doing today? Well, happy Friday. Um, so like Dr. Lee Brage said, um, I'm not too far out of your guys' shoes. I think I took this in 2016. So just about six years ago, uh, I was sitting in your shoes, uh, worrying about some of these later tests, all the different classes overlapping, um, just trying to understand, uh, is this material useful? What's going on with this? Um, and so hopefully today I can provide a few answers for that for you and show you some really cool project examples and kind of get you a little, little bit excited uh, about some of the real world applications of mechanics of materials. So today, first I'm going to start off with a safety moment um, in a second. Uh, at Burns and McDonald, safety is one of our number one things. Um, and once you get out into the real world with construction and engineering, uh, it's a very dangerous place. Um, so we like to start our meetings off with a safety moment to kind of uh, keep our minds focused on where it needs to be. Um, then I'll give a short personal background and uh, company background on Burns and McDonald, um, and then talk about a few project examples so you can kind of see the different things that we're doing and how this might apply um, before actually getting into the, the details of, okay, how, how am I using mechanics and material, uh, materials on a daily basis? And then finally, I have some uh, real world uh, problem solving uh, kind of examples uh, outside of mechanics and materials, just different things to consider also on a project. So to start off with our safety moment, uh, this week is National Work Zone Awareness Week. Um, so uh, I know I always hate driving through work zones, it slows everybody down, but uh, it's also really important to make sure that we're putting our phones down, slowing down, and really paying attention. In 2020, uh, there was 774 fatal accidents in a work zone. Um, so make sure whenever you're going through those, just to be really aware, look out for different workers. They might be crossing, um, crossing the road, um, and just make sure you're alert. So a little bit of a background on me. So originally I'm from Augusta, Missouri. Um, as you can see in the picture, it's kind of about an hour outside St. Louis uh, before I headed here to Rolla where I got my bachelor's in 2018 and then stayed uh, for my master's and finished that in 2019. Um, so since I finished my master's, I've been working at Burns McDonald for about three years um, where I've gotten a wide variety of experience. Uh, I've worked on like over 35 different bridges uh, 20 different like walls and culverts um, where I'll do structural design, uh, but then outside structural design, I'll even do some hydraulic design, construction inspection, uh, and permitting. Uh, so a little background on Burns and McDonald. 
Uh, so we're an engineering and construction firm uh, with over 7,600 professionals. And I think that's at even over 8,000 now uh, as we've been growing uh, with 60 uh, plus offices worldwide. Um, so then we are the number nine ranked uh, design firm, uh, according to engineering news record um, and a 100% employee owned company. So as you can see, uh, like I mentioned, we have over 60 plus offices. So in almost every major city across the US uh, and then our headquarters being in Kansas City. And then not only do we have uh, locations across the US, but we also have uh, several international offices uh, as well as different international project experience. So everything highlighted in blue is a country that we've had a project in. Um, so I'll be talking about bridges, uh, which is what I do today, but across our company, we do a bunch of different things. So we'll do anything from like power generation, uh, airports, manufacturing, um, telecommunications, transmission and distribution, uh, water treatment, data centers, battery storage, uh, just about any kind of infrastructure, you name it, and we do it. Um, but then besides all of the cool work that we do, um, it's also a really fun place to work. So it being an employee-owned company uh, really adds to the culture of the company. Um, and then we do a lots of different things outside of work to kind of make it a fun place uh, besides the job portion. So we'll do different things, different uh, volunteering. We'll have a charity of choice each year that we'll do different events for. Um, lots of people will do different intramurals. Uh, playing sports with each other. Uh, we even have our own Burns and McDonald softball league because we have so many people in Kansas City. Um, in the bottom right, uh, we have a barbecue competition for our client uh, barbecue each year. Um, so all of these things are just uh, outside of work if you want, and they're just really fun um, things that makes it a great place to work. So to give you guys a little background on some of the different transportation projects that I might work on and some of the things we'll be talking about today, um, this first one is the Lewis and Clark Viaduct. So if you're from the Kansas City area, uh, this is I-70 going west over the Kansas River uh, right before it meets up with the Missouri River. Um, so as you can see, this is kind of a complex, very long bridge um, where it, there's lots of different constraints. So there's a railroad, uh, going under it, uh, kind of out of the picture, there's an airport uh, that we had to consider the flight path of airplanes coming in. Um, and you can and see there's different uh, even structure types. So there's concrete, steel, um, and everything in between. So the picture on the left uh, is showing the construction. So right here is a, a 12 foot tall girder for scale. And you can even kind of see there's a person kind of standing out over here um, for scale. So 12 feet, it's probably close to the top of the ceiling. Um, so a lot of times in class, you'll do different problems with different beams, but uh, it's really interesting and exciting into the real world, seeing some, some of the different sizes that you work with and how that affects it. Um, and then the picture on the right shows the construction. So uh, a lot of times these spans are so long that a crane can't just pick up and they can't just uh, ship out one entire beam. So they'll build these in different sections and then they'll splice them together. So you can see there's some uh, temporary shoring here uh, outside the permanent piers uh, to kind of help hold it up. And then there'll be another piece coming in here that'll um, fit up and they'll bolt it uh, to make one continuous piece. And this was a very long project too. So as you can see, this isn't even over the river, but there's uh, all these different sections. Uh, sometimes we'll be working with uh, different cities on how they want it aesthetically looking. So we had to do a special aset uh, aesthetic substructure here. And then the picture on the right uh, shows uh, there's a pedestrian bridge that is uh, adjacent to this project. Um, so I think this shows a really cool image of uh, the middle of construction, uh, how they're building those girders. Um, so another similar project example, but on the St. Louis side that we've done 
uh, is the Daniel Boone Missouri River Bridge. Uh, so this is I-64 and 40 that goes uh, into Chesterfield Bottom. So if you're kind of familiar with that area, uh, we had another uh, large span bridge here. So this opening was actually uh, 510 feet. Uh, that's the navigation span. So uh, as you can imagine, when you're doing your problems, if you have the L and it's 510 feet, you get really high moments and really big deflections. Uh, so that's why the girders on this project were actually like 13 feet tall uh, to give you that bigger moment of inertia. And then uh, we don't do as many as often anymore, but uh, we, we, will, we will do some truss bridges as well. So this is uh, the Veteran Memorial Bridge in South Omaha. Um, so they're a little less common now because of cost. Uh, they're considered fracture critical. So they, if, they were, if a member were to fail, you could have a catastrophic failure of the bridge. So for some of those reasons and the extra costs, you don't see these quite as often anymore. Uh, but in certain applications, they're uh, still very useful. And then we'll work on not only designing new bridges, but we'll also do some uh, construction rehabilitation and work on existing bridges. Uh, so you guys have probably seen bridges like this all over when you're driving on the interstate. Uh, it's just your standard overpass, nothing too exciting right here. Um, but the major problem with this bridge is how tall it is over the interstate. So this bridge might have a 14 foot clearance and you'll get these really big trucks and they keep getting bigger and bigger or people want to bring really tall equipment through. Um, so these will, these trucks will actually hit bridges sometimes and they'll tear up these outside uh, beams. Um, so then you'll have to do some kind of emergency repair and really fix it up. So with the Kansas Turnpike Association and what we're doing with them is we're actually helping to raise these bridges so that way they have a 15 foot 10 clearance they can get better freight in and uh, more freight through their interstates and they don't have to worry about these bridges getting hit all the time. So we'll start with this by just kind of starting to chip off the concrete at the each end of the bridge and once the bridge is then free uh, we'll actually put these hydraulic jacks um, under each of uh, each of the girders. Um, and you can see we'll do this at the ends of the bridge, at the piers, um, and then they'll simultaneously lift the bridge up an inch. They'll put a shim in. Uh, they'll lift it up another inch. They'll put a shim in all the way till you get to the proper height where you'll put a new bolster. Um, so this is a really wide, like, eye-opening to me whenever I first started because uh, I had never even heard about raising a bridge. Like uh, if you think it's like millions of pounds of weight and there's these little jacks that can handle a uh, hundred kips or a hundred thousand pounds a jack. And these things will be able to raise this 15 inches up in the air. So it's uh, truly amazing um, when you kind of think about it from that perspective and how far some of the construction equipment's gone. And then we'll even do some uh, airport projects. So this is LaGuardia Airport in New York uh, at the Delta Terminal. Um, so Burns and McDonald is redoing the entire terminal for Delta. Um, and so part of that was redoing all of, uh, all of the entrances and exits and ramps. Um, so as you can see, there's, uh, this can be a really complex prob uh, project uh, with lots of curvature uh, there are several temporary bridges on this because you have to leave traffic open all times because your airport still has to operate. So we designed bridges for two years and then we'd tear them down uh, so this permanent bridge could take its place. So then how does this apply uh, to mechanics and materials? How does some of this stuff overlap? So I think a lot of times you'll be dealing with different beam type problems in this class. Um, you see lots of different examples like that. So a beam, or we call it a girder in the bridge world, um, is also very common to us. So uh, you'll have your shear moments that you're doing, you're checking your bending stress, your shear stress, your deflections, uh, you would calculate your composite properties, um, and there's different construction considerations as well. So we'll start uh, by calculating the different loads. Uh, so we'll start with like a dead load, which is if you can imagine 
that 12 or 13 foot girder that that's going to weigh a lot. That's a lot of steel right there. So it's going to have a lot of deflection under its own weight and a lot of uh, stress under just sitting up there by itself. Uh, so we'll calculate all of that and the dead load will consider uh, the bridge deck. How much does that concrete weigh on top of it? Is there any barriers or light poles, anything that'll be there permanently? And then we'll start with the live load which is essentially just your vehicle traffic and trucks going over it. Uh, we'll consider wind loading, uh, seismic earthquake loading, uh, and several other, other types of loading depending on the project. Um, so for some of these river bridges, we will even consider a barge hitting it. So uh, we'll consider and calculate, okay, how much does this barge weigh? How fast does it travel through this area? And if it were to hit one of these piers, how many millions of pounds of force uh, do we have to design for? So this is actually a model showing um, one, one of the spans in the Lewis and Clark project. Um, so you can see all the different girders and the different shear uh, and moments. So the moment you have your positive and negative moment showing in the different colors. Um, so then we'll have to calculate the different properties. Um, and so like, I know you guys talk about two different materials and calculating the composite properties in class. Uh, so we'll also do something similar with these girders. So if you look on top of these girders, you'll notice these little studs every uh, few inches. Um, these are called shear studs and they'll help make the girder composite with the deck. So that way, whenever your deck's deflecting, you have a fully composite bridge and your um, girders will deflect with it and you get it acting uniformly. Uh, so then you can really take advantage of the composite section property rather than just designing what your girder section properties are. So like you've seen before, you'll just have your ratio N of your different modulus of elasticities, and you can use that to calculate the centroid, uh, the steel and, using the steel and concrete properties, and then the moment of inertia, which will go into all of our other calculations. Um, so then we'll look at different allowable stresses, allowable forces. Uh, so this is actually from a pre-stress girder design that I had done. Um, so with the diff with the AASHTO code, they'll give you different allowable stresses for different scenarios. So you'll have your maximum compression stress and your maximum tens tensile stress. Um, and you'll then go and calculate your stresses like you guys talk about in class all the time and then compare to make sure that you fall under and you'll try to optimize your design, try to use an efficient amount of materials and then uh, go from there. So for like this beam right here, uh, this pre-stressed concrete beam, we'll have all those loads, those shear moments. So then we can calculate our bending stresses, your sigma equals MY over I, um, I using some of those composite properties. Um, but then we'll also have an axial stress, so it'll be kind of a combined loading. So for these pre-stressed girders, um, all of these strands right here that are shown, uh, they'll actually be pulled um, at a concrete plant while they're pouring the concrete, and they'll leave all that thousands of pounds of stress in these steel strands, and then they'll cut them, and then it'll cause compression in the member. Um, so they do this because concrete's weak in tension and it's strong in compression. So if you can get more compression in the member, then when you have your tensile stresses from your bending, uh, from your MY over I, um, then that'll help you um, since you already have compression going through the member. Uh, so we'll calculate the stresses considering both the axial and the bending stress. Um, so then we'll also consider deflection. So you might be familiar with the simply supported beams um, and so we'll have different cases. Sometimes we'll have continuous beams with um, multiple reactions. Sometimes we'll have a simply supported case like this where we'll use these equations. So like you'd expect, you want to calculate a maximum uh, allowable deflection because when you're driving over a bridge, I don't know about you, but I don't want it to like sink down like a foot, even if it, it's not going to fail. I mean, that makes me uncomfortable. Um, Yeah, so it, it does not deflect very much. So that's one of the checks. But then outside of that, also you want to consider uh, what's called camber. 
So if you imagine there's a roadway and the roadway might be on a curve. So let's say it's a, a crest curve. So it'll go up and go down or a sag curve where it'll go down then go up, or maybe it's on some high grade, you're going up a hill. Um, if you imagine those, again, those 12, 13 foot girders, they're going to deflect a lot on its own, just under its self weight before you even have all this loading on top of it. Well, we'll what we'll do is we'll camber the girders and we'll actually fabricate them. So they're uh, bent up to allow for and calculate what that final deflection needs to be. So your riding surface of your concrete deck is the correct driving surface. So you don't have this big deflection because they can deflect several inches under their own um, self weight. And then there's different construction scenarios. So that's kind of like what this model is showing. Um, so they have to build those temporary uh, shoring towers. So that way um, those pieces are so big, they can't just hold them up there with like a million cranes. So they'll build a temporary pier, say like, this is the permanent pier, this is the temporary pier, and then this will deflect up. So with just the dead load on it and the self weight, it'll go down and then this will this end will come up. So they have to know where that's at. So that way they can fit out that other piece and that way they can match it and actually get the pieces to fit together, um, which is really tough construction uh, problem for contractors. So then after you have your girders designed, um, you got to think about what are those sitting on, not just straight sitting on the substructure, but they're usually sitting on some kind of bearing. Uh, so there's lots of different types of bearings. Um, and this is one of the most common ones for a, a typical size bridge. Uh, it's a laminated bearing pad with uh, rubber with steel plates inside with rubber layers in between each uh, steel plate. Uh, so if you kind of think back to maybe like the first couple weeks of class, uh, you'll just figure out your bearing stress. So let's say this is able to hold uh, a thousand uh, PSI of bearing stress. So you know your force from your reactions uh, when you're calculating your shear and moments. Um, and then you just divide that by the area so you can si have the correct size pad. Um, but then also you need to consider thermal movements. So if you also remember, I think back from earlier in the class, um, as things heat up and cool down, they're going to expand and contract, uh, which is the, based on the type of material or this alpha. Um, and then depending on where you are in the country, you'll have different design temperature ranges, and then you'll multiply that by the length. So when you get these really long bridges, say like that 500 foot span, um, it's going to, it's going to expand a lot in the middle of the summer and you might have several inches of movement. And if you don't design for that movement, then you have to use that force, uh, that restricted force, kind of like you guys would do examples for. And that can be really high on some of these large bridges. Um, so that's what these bearings will then take. So they'll have this design movement they can take. Um, so this is a good example kind of showing one of these bearings uh, tolerating some of that movement and allowing some of that movement um, which is where shear deformation would play into. So um, each of these bearings will have an allowable shear deformation, and you can see the shear strain almost exactly like some of those uh, book problems show. And then I don't know if you guys have gotten to it quite yet, but uh, there's also a lot of combined loading scenarios. So this is a substructure element. Um, so there's these columns or drilled shafts. And there's all this loading on top of it from this beam that it's sitting on um, from all the girders sitting on it. Um, so then you'll have these high axial stresses, but it's not actually always like centered in the middle of this column. So you'll have an eccentric load. So if you imagine it'll, if you're pushing, so let's say you're pushing down on me right here. So if you push down on my head, I'm just going to go straight down. But if you push like this, it's going to bend. So you have that axial force and that bending force combined that you have to design for. Um, so that's on top of all the different lateral and longitudinal loads um, that you have to design for that we talked about, like earthquakes and wind, um, barges, and um, a lot of other things. So then kind of getting away from the specifics of the mechanic, mechanics and materials, there's several different real world problems that you can run into 
uh, that you might not always think about in classes, but you might have to design for and consider um, on top of it. So uh, Mother Nature is one, uh, like these large floods. So this is not a bridge we designed. This is an emergency replacement that we did. But you can see um, down here, this is the bridge that was attached right here. So this was a small creek and it washed away the bridge. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of high forces whenever you get um, water up over the bridge. And especially if it's moving fast, uh, you can imagine um, that can cause some high loads. Yep. So then uh, that was something that we had done. We'd done a, an emergency replacement of this bridge. And you might even notice where the, the bridge length, it was about, the end of the bridge was about here from the first time, here and here. Um, and now it's a lot longer. So that was a consideration of part of our hydraulic design. So we said, okay, if it's this percent chance of flooding with the 1% the flood is going to be this high, um, we need to make this bridge longer so more water can get under it and it doesn't trap and block it so we don't have that overtopping. And so that way it's not uh, those high forces of the water uh, pushing on those girders. And this is a project that I worked on um, about a year or two ago. Um, this might look like a normal bridge on the right. And it looks like it's just kind of going uphill. In reality, what it's supposed to be is it's supposed to be flat. And um, the end of the bridge actually sank about three feet. So uh, when we were looking at it, they kind of dug up and they found um, in this old bridge it had a very poor substructure and the river um, and the stream, it just kept, every time it would flood, it would kind of undercut it and the soil um, underneath it would just get weaker and weaker until eventually it just failed. So we had done a, an, a replacement of that bridge and then now considering better substructures, it went a lot deeper um, and we even opened that channel up. So it's kind of further back away um, outside the erosion area. And then another thing is complex geometries. Uh, so this is I-470 and US-50 in Lee Summit, Missouri. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here. This bridge is curving. Uh, there's vertical curvature in all of these uh, bridges as well. You can see the roadway geometry um, is complex. And that was kind of a big thing coming out of school uh, that I didn't really like, thought about much is, okay, we're solving all these problems. They're basic. They're straightforward. Everything's 90 degrees or 45 degrees, really nice um, but when you get out into the real world, you have all these different curves and complexities that you need to consider. And uh, that was just kind of like a big, not learning curve exactly, but like kind of eye-opening thing for me about how much time we spend with some of the complexities um, that are out in the real world. And then last but not least, there's a whole list of different issues uh, that kind of can can make your projects go uh, crazy. So whether it's supply chain and you're struggling to get the needed supplies on time for the construction schedule uh, or increased costs due to the supply chain, uh, traffic closures and phasing. Um, so you might have to design two separate cases because you might have to build half your bridge and then you have to build the second half. So um, you don't have your full width to start. Um, or where you can put your peers and what space do you have available? Um, so what right away do you have access to? Uh, is there utilities in the way that you have to miss? Uh, do you have to avoid things for the airport or railroads? And is there any environmental restrictions? Um, so with all that, you can see there's several mechanics and materials topics in the real world. Um, so it's really important. So even if you don't become a bridge engineer, um, and you're not using this on the day-to-day, -day, uh, it's still really important to know because a lot of the people that you work with on different projects will still use this. And having that fundamental knowledge to just be able to kind of picture and, and check and understand what's going on um, is really helpful. So, for example, like I might work with an environmental person 
And so I had to take a couple of environmental classes in school and I don't do that design, but I have to understand kind of what, where they're coming from. And that helps me so much in my job. If I at least have their background too, even if I'm not doing it every day um, with mechanics and materials, I am using it almost on a daily basis. Um, so this class was really helpful for me, but um, I think it's just very important for everyone to just have this, this good fundamental basis um, in the course. Uh, so you can see there's definitely a lot of engineering challenges and that's kind of what makes my job fun is every day there's a new problem. Uh, we're coming up with good solutions um, and I get a lot of variety of work. As you can see, there's a lot of different things that you can do uh, in bridge engineering. Um, to me, that is what makes it such a re rewarding career. Um, so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer.